Welcome to this Halloween special video on The Midnight Circus, a setting for the entire world of darkness. The Midnight Circus is the object of much speculation among mortals and supernaturals, a traveling carnival that leaves confusion, chaos, and despair in its wake. It appears from nowhere and disappears just as quickly, its painted wagons traveling through lands and realms of reality like a phantom, with a trail of demonic entities and broken souls following behind it, held in the circus's thrall. But how did the Midnight Circus come to be? What is behind its appeal and power? Can it be stopped? So, without further ado, The Midnight Circus. The origin of the Midnight Circus lies in prehistory with a migratory cult that worshipped a spirit known as Kara. This deity was later identified with the Roman goddess Karna, patron of festivals, masks, and exchange. As with most transactional gods, mortals would sacrifice to Kara, and she would cure their sicknesses or ensure bountiful harvests. Kara's primary link to the material plane was a tree, tended by the white priesthood, while the priestesses performed the rites under the guidance of the white queen, the white priest, and the lord of reigns. This primitive cult likely would have gone the way of many other missing and lost gods of antiquity. However, a vampire known to the Cainite mythology as Namriel the Enochite took an interest in the cult. Whether Namriel was a vampire of the first or second city is unknown. Vampires who have studied Namriel believe that she chose to side with humanity against her own kind, either out of beneficence or self-aggrandizement. But Namriel not only revealed the secrets of Cainites, but of the changing breeds, the restless dead, and the fair folk. Namriel rose high among the priestesses of Kara, becoming Lord of Reigns, until one night when Kara called on Namriel to sacrifice herself so that the rites of Kara could be continued. The vampire freely gave her blood to the tree, and the white priesthood traveled as far east as the Indus River and west as the Atlantic Ocean. Other spirits joined the traveling rites of Kara, but even gods must bend to the whims of time. The purpose of the rites of Kara were gradually supplanted by the reveries of Dionysus. The principle of voluntary exchange was replaced by the simple taking of what the carnival, as it came to be known by the time of Rome, was owed. And the carnival took whatever the attendees held most dear as payment for entry to the reveries. Health, wealth, beauty, strength, knowledge, or purity. The carnival was darker than it had been before, but it was not demonic. Not yet. That infestation would come with the invitation to the being Egyptians called the Lord of Chaos, the Great Devourer, Apep, or Apophis. Apophis hungered for souls and worship. The goddess Kara struck a bargain with Apophis to maintain the efficacy of the rites in exchange for the serpent's power. Kara managed to hold Apophis's darkness in check for years, but with each passing decade, Kara's power waned while Apophis grew fat and sleek on the souls that the carnival claimed. Meanwhile, the carnival continued to change. As mentioned earlier, those who answered directly to Kara were the White Queen, the White Priest, and the Lord of Reigns. After Namriel's sacrifice to Kara, the Lord of Reigns was always held by a vampire. The title ultimately changed to the Ruler of Two Worlds, symbolizing the state of living death that vampires exist in. By the time of the reign of the Roman Princeps, Kaiser Augustus, the Holy Tree of Kara died, depriving the goddess of most of her power and allowing Apophis to assume near-complete control of the rites. The White Priesthood, in terror of Apophis, sought to counter Apophis' influence with that of the primordial spirit of entropy, or, as the shape-changers called it, the Worm of Corruption. The office of the White Priest was usurped by that of the Ringmaster, and the carnival came to be known as the Lunar Carnival. So by the fall of Rome, we had the ruler of two worlds, Theodoric the Goth, and the Ringmaster, with the last remnant of the original rites of Kara being the White Queen. In between the 8th and 9th centuries AD, the White Queen was overthrown by the mysterious she called Astarte, who took the title of Autumn Queen and Queen of the Carnival. Astarte enabled the Lunar Carnival to travel farther than it ever had before and appear seemingly from nowhere adding to the legend of the haunted caravans not only among mortals, but mages and changelings. The white priesthood receded into the background of the circus, reduced to explaining the mysteries of Kara through plays and puppet shows. Their leader became known in the Middle Ages as the King's Fool, and they predictably 
became clowns. In the 15th century AD, Anastasio Salvatorio, a Nafondi mage who had once been a celestial chorister, became the ringmaster of the circus. With the skill of a master juggler, tumbler, and trapeze artist combined, he moderated between the entropic and infernal forces that competed for power, and eventually struck a bargain with Astarte to destroy the then ruler of the two worlds, Mordland of Clan Tremere, replacing him with the more pliable Toreador elder, Calibris. This triumvirate has since ruled the Lunar Carnival as the Infernal Trinity, and transformed it from an object of decay into an engine of nightmare and horror. Calibris would befuddle the minds and senses of the circus's victims with illusions. Astarte used her powerful glamours to hold time and entropy at bay within the circus, and the ringmaster, Anastadio Salvatorio, collected the souls of the carnival's victims to feed the carnival's gods, or the stakeholders as he called them. The next evolution of the Lunar Carnival came in the 18th and 19th century with the creation of the modern circus, innovated by Philip Astley of Newcastle under Lyme and perfected by Phineas T. Barnum, Charles E. Ringling, Adam J. Forpaw, William Batty, and the Worth family, to name but a few. Anastasio, not to be outdone, added a big tent, trick riders, animals, and other attractions. Where the larger circuses stayed away from the smaller towns to maximize their ticket sales, Anastasio's old-time Lunar Carnival and Midnight Circus, as it was known by in at least 1857, would appear in these places almost from nowhere, which only added to its mystique. But rumors followed the Midnight Circus wherever it went, missing children, disfigurements, and insanity. The three rulers of the circus kept a tight leash on the performers and a tighter lid on the circus's travel schedule. A few clergymen and other investigators have managed to suss out a portion of the circus's infernal nature and tried to warn their neighbors against it, but such warnings were either rebuffed or came too late. Meanwhile, the Midnight Circus has since rolled along, ensnaring the souls of the innocent and the guilty alike. The Midnight Circus both is and is not of this world. Thanks to the intermingling of energies at work upon the circus, its occupants, visitors, and victims are caught in a web of illusion, corruption, and time. With the worm and apophis at its heart, the Midnight Circus is a trap for souls to feed these cosmic horrors with a number of lures and snares. However, there is still some element of the original rites of Kara concealed within the dark labyrinth of the Midnight Circus. The various forces at play in the circus make it impossible for most supernaturals to comprehend without exposing themselves to its corruption. It is this corruption field, the mixture of entropic and infernal energies that form the snares, barbs, and investments that are used to take souls from the circus's victims. Every hook into the victim's soul is placed there willingly, more or less, a sacrifice freely given in exchange for something that the circus will provide, whether it is as mundane as money, prizes, entertainment, sex, weapons to slay enemies, or even secret knowledge. But the price is always the same, a piece of the soul, piece by piece, until you have nothing left to give. Snares are the most mundane of the Midnight Circus's claims upon one's soul. Snares can be acquired simply by patronizing the carnival, enjoying the attractions, drinking its alcohol, or eating its food. Most snares can be gained by bargaining for objects of power or even supernatural gifts. Snares will fade with time, though they never completely disappear. But enough snares can form a barb. Barbs are permanent influences the circus have over the souls of its victims. In most instances, the infernal trinity are content to let its patron escape with a single barb, which manifests as memory lapses, minor alterations to the victim's perceptions, and an aura that revolts most animals. With a second barb, the victim's senses are accessible to the Infernal Trinity, so long as they are on the circus's grounds. More troubling is that they give off an aura of entropic corruption, or what werewolves describe as smelling of the worm. The addition of a third barb allows the Infernal Trinity to see through the eyes and ears of their victims wherever they go. The smell of the worm increases to the point where it is noticeable to unawakened mortals, and the will of the victim is even more bent to that of the circus. At a fourth barb, the Infernal Trinity may observe their puppet in any realm of the Tellurian, and even seize temporary control of their body. The fifth and final barb turns the victim into a permanent thrall of the Midnight Circus, a new performer, or cardi, or freak, 
to be used however the Infernal Trinity deems fit. They become one with the circus. Only the Infernal Trinity, or a spirit of comparable power to the Celestial Incarna, or one of the remaining followers of Kara, can free someone from barbs. There are also those who know how to use some of what is behind the circus and think to themselves, yeah, let me just go ahead and sell my soul to the forces of corruption and oblivion. For those happy few, investments are available. Investments are direct bargains between the servitor demons attached to the Midnight Circus, so what they can provide has limits. The circus can certainly grant a variety of supernatural powers along with certain favors. A request along the lines of the severed head of Cain or the soul of Osiris will be rejected, because not even the Infernal Trinity could perform such a task, let alone the lesser demons of the circus. The bigger the request, the more of one's soul must be bargained to the circus. Three primary forces control the carnival's destiny. The players may hear the ringmaster refer to them obliquely as the stakeholders. This phrase refers to the circus's three patrons, the defiler worm, the infernal, as represented by the demon Apophis, and the goddess Kara. The defiler worm's influence is the most keenly felt of the circus's patrons. While the carnival may ultimately be predicated to entropy and destruction through the demon Apophis, its most obvious power is in its corruption. The defiler worm feeds richly from the souls the carnival consecrates in its name. No place that the carnival visits remains unscathed. Few who enter the circus gather enough barbs to become enslaved, but even the most casual contact corrupts. The circus defiles a town by its very presence, and all who meet it, even if they only gain one snare, are easier targets for the worm in the future. The agents of the worm visit the circus somewhat more frequently than the carnival's demonic contacts. Of the Infernal Trinity, only the ringmaster has extensive dealings with the worm. Astarte, a disciple of Apophis, views the worm as unclean, while Calibris avoids it out of general good sense. As a rule, the circus's infernal patrons do not deal directly with anyone except the Infernal Trinity. Despite this aloofness, they are highly protective of their investment and guard it viciously from other infernal entities. The circus's demonic patrons are shadowy figures, every bit as mysterious as the defiler worm. The ringmaster has the most experience with them, though Astarte is more knowledgeable about their leader, Apophis. The ancient Egyptians acknowledged Apophis as a force representing entropy and decay, and it is the main energy that drives the carnival. However, even the lowliest roustabouts know that there is a third force at work, but few know anything of its true nature. Some tell tales of seeing a ghostly woman in white whose presence awakens long-forgotten emotions. Those who know something of the circus's history are aware that the carnival once had a very different purpose than it does today. The goddess Kara and Namriel the Enochite originally created the circus to protect humanity from the multitude of horrors that walked the night. Now there is little left of the carnival's original purpose. The way of Kara lies buried under the twin powers of the worm and Apophis. Still, like a fragile blade of grass, it sometimes pushes its way to the surface. Concealing the dark heart of the Midnight Circus is the Glamour Veil. It is a power that cuts across all paradigms of mystical power in the world of darkness. As for what it is, no one knows, not even the masters of the circus, though they make sure to maintain its power. Its most basic effect, the Glamour Veil covers its creatures in an illusion that makes them more acceptable to local cultures and customs. This allows the carnies to mix with the peoples of the towns they visit, and forces most people to see whatever it is they expect a traveling carnival to look like. Additionally, the Glamour Veil operates similarly to the Veil of the Garu, or the Fog of the Wraiths, in that it forces unawakened mortals to rationalize away the bizarre occurrences they see or hear. The Glamour Veil also allows the Midnight Circus to escape through portals between realms thanks to Astarte, keeping it from being truly destroyed, though it is extremely draining on both Astarte and the circus itself. The Glamour Veil has the power to shunt those who attempt violence against the circus and its members into a violence realm, essentially a spiritual rubber room complete with replicas of the circus that can be punched, shot, stabbed, clawed, burned, strangled, etc. The longer an attacker spends in the violence realm, the more snares and barbs they gain until their soul is completely forfeit. The only escape is to cease all violence. Additionally, 
Glamour Vale fortifies its denizens against mental tampering by powers outside of the circus. This includes vampiric efforts to dominate them, magical mind effects, and the like. However, the Glamour Vale has its drawbacks. If a member of the circus attacks a visitor, the Glamour Vale breaks around them, at least temporarily. Another way of breaking the Glamour Veil is to disable certain artifacts which fortify and amplify it around the carnival grounds. This might mean strategically and covertly breaking innocuous objects like popcorn machines and carousels that are really infernal objects. By day, the Midnight Circus is a dilapidated, mid-sized carnival. The tents are colorful but weathered. Its wagons are gaily painted but peeling and mildewed. But by night, the carnival becomes something else, a bright, ominous spectacle, hypnotizing and macabre. New tents and attractions seem to appear from nowhere, and some patrons, seemingly entranced, enter these tents, some of which lead not only to supernatural horrors, but even other realms of reality. However, the Midnight Circus is not bound to a set schedule. The playbill varies depending on the audience, especially when a patron is of interest to the infernal trinity who rules the Midnight Circus. A Gauru visitor might be treated to a mock wolf hunt carried out by the clowns. A Tremere seeking to uncover the secrets of the circus would be ushered to a magic show, featuring various magic acts that resemble the rituals of their clan. As for regular acts, here are but a few. The main attraction of the Midnight Circus is the Big Top, a large, dark blue tent covered with astrological signs, including the symbol of the circus, a man in a crescent moon with a serpent coiled around its eye. Entrance to the circus is a mere four dollars, for which the patron is treated to the death-defying horsemanship of the De Questo family riders, the well-trained pachyderms Friedrich and Lou, who are taken through their paces by their trainer, Klaus Rahn, the trapeze artistry of the Duterte family, Jean, Guy, and Aubrey, with Jean's wife, Colette. They are followed up by the Cossack dervish Sergei Gumilov and his dancers, who by day serve as mimes, ride operators, and vendors. The dervishes are followed by Bill Bullock's tigers and arctic wolves, who he has jumped through flaming hoops, leap onto platforms on demand, and even play volleyball, depending on the engagement of the audience. Finally, one of the leaders of the circus, Calibris, takes the spotlight with his magic show, where flocks of birds appear from the roof of the ceiling of the tent and disappear just as quickly. Sometimes, even the audience's clothes change colors at Calibris' gesture. Lastly is Bishop's Family Clown Review, a vivid and supposedly virtuous performance led by the aforementioned Bishop. The review is always a parable of some type, but the parable is open to interpretation, and the audience almost always sees what they want to see. The Clown Orchestra plays out the audience so that they may enjoy the other attractions and entertainments described by Anastagio, or Devin Cavendish, before they leave. For those who find Bishop's Clown Review too moral or tame, they may seek out Koba's Progressive Clown Show, or Blotto's Clown Alley. The interior of Koba's side tent is plastered with posters, proclaiming his comedic genius, along with Koba's various wise sayings such as, Progressive clowning will lead mankind to a happier future. Under Koba, all clowns are fun, all children are happy. And, tragedy is comedy. Along with kitschy images depicting Koba surrounded by clowns and smiling, happy comrades. The show begins with clowns in workmen's clothes emerging from a trap door. A clown in a bishop's robe and cassock makes his way through the proletarian clowns picking their wallets. The orchestra shifts as Koba emerges surrounded by his enforcers, observing the pilfering cleric. Koba proceeds to bludgeon the bishop with a tire iron and retrieve the stolen goods. It is at this point that the show actually begins. At no point in the show is Koba ever in any danger of being a figure of fun. Regardless of the crude antics of the clowns around him and mockery of Bishop's Family Clown Review, Koba is always mild, reasonable, and most importantly, right in whatever he comments on, usually a dissertation on the ironclad laws of comedy and how they will inevitably lead to a utopian future where all will laugh. At the end of this <clears throat> performance, Koba loudly announces that there is a traitor among them, usually one named Stephen. This Stephen is then chased down by Koba's clown followers with sticks around the tent, up and down the aisles, and so on. He hops on a unicycle to escape. But just as it seems he will outrun the clown mob, 
a poster unrolls that reads, Enemies of Progressive Humor Beware. The poster is then ripped in half by a bear riding a motorcycle. Cobra then proclaims that even brute beasts understand Cobra's wide stewardship of entertainment and leap to defend his noble vision. The biker bear then circles poor Steven to a growing drum roll. At its crescendo, the bear snatches up Steven and eats him, to the sage nods of Koba. When the bear is done with its feast, it spits up a clown shoe, and is then herded out of the tents by Koba's sycophants, marking the end of the show. Those clowns who are deemed unfit for Bishop's Family Clown Review or Koba's Progressive Clown Show are consigned to Clown Alley, which is overseen by the drunk and disheveled Blotto. Clown Alley is composed of several clowns who wander around making balloon animals, tumbling, and juggling. When not working the circus grounds, they sequester themselves in the Clown Alley tent. These are usually performers who have had so much of their souls taken that they are nearly useless and fit only to be fed to Apophis and the worm. Most choose to benumb their soulless states with alcohol and drugs, rotting away one day at a time. Their nights are filled with terrors. But underneath the grease paint of many of the Clown Alley clowns is, well, nothing. Many have no faces beneath their makeup. Blotto knows somewhat that the circus is ruled by malign forces, but he has no power to stop them. So he drinks, flirts with women, tells politically incorrect jokes, and is actually quite good at clowning when he's sober. For his part, Blotto tries to make his charges comfortable in their final slide down to spiritual destruction. Nearby Clown Alley is the Tunnel of Love, overseen by Lee Carmody, who can usually be found at his booth reading some vintage porno magazine with a lemur on his shoulder, who always appears to be reading along with him. But Carmody is always on the lookout for those with a taste for degeneracy. The Tunnel of Love is largely harmless during the day. However, most leave the ride feeling at least some sense of having been violated by the end. But when the sun goes down, the entrance of the tunnel takes on the appearance of a maw. The two-seater car goes down into a dark river filled with smoke. Corpses float along the river, holding trays of chocolates in their desiccated hands and more chocolates in their mouths for those who don't mind a pinch of putrescence with their cocoa. A chained policeman dances behind glass, chained to an organ grinder monkey, which cranks the music box in time with the listless dancer. A corpse emerges from the water, pinned to a cross with a stake through his heart, trimmed with red, white, and blue ribbons. The boat takes on a sudden turn to another passage, and visitors see a woman reclining on furs, cruelly ignoring a clown's heartfelt declarations of love. She throws a piece of her clothing into the water, and the clown dives in after it. As the clown returns to the surface, glowing tentacles wrap around the clown and drag him under the water until the bubbles stop. A smiling ape bangs a drum as shadows seem to dance in the dark of the ride. The shadows get closer and closer to the boat, but the tentacles drag them under the water too. As the lights go out completely, laughter fills the tunnel. The tentacles rise out of the water on either side of the boat. Then the boat smacks into the doors, back to the outside world, and the ride ends. Lee Carmody helps the riders out of the boat with a wink and a smile. The memory of what happened in the tunnel fades into a blur of misremembered discomfort. However, a rider gains three snares from the experience of taking a boat ride into a wormish labyrinth. Carmody is unaware of the true nature of his ride, though he does believe in the existence of vampires, werewolves, and wraiths. The chain dancer in the tunnel is a wraith named Luke Carpenter. In 1880, he was a Chicago police detective investigating the circus before he was torn apart by the black spiral dancers of the animal show and has been trapped in the tunnel of love ever since. His music monkey musician is a scrag, which stands guard over him. The festively staked corpse is a vampire, and the Venus in furs is a she of the unseely court. As for the tunnel of love's river, it is a gateway into the black spiral labyrinth, and those who descend or are dragged down far enough through the water will eventually end up in the maw of the worm itself. Like much of the circus, the Ferris wheel appears completely normal to the unawakened eye. For those who can access the Shadowlands, the Ferris wheel is the heart of a maelstrom storm. In the Shadowlands, the Ferris wheel, when seen with Argus, the ride has a black serpent coiled around its frame, 
holding its tail in its mouth similar to an Ouroboros. The howling winds will draw in any wraith that comes near it. Wraiths caught in the storm first lose pathos, then willpower, then corpus as the wheel tries to drag them straight into oblivion. Even if a wraith should escape the mini maelstrom, they gain two snares. The only way to escape once snared is to destroy the ferris wheel both in the skinlands and the shadowlands simultaneously. Further along in the carnival is Xanadu's Mirror Palace. Its mirror maze is a large Baroque funhouse that contains all of the usual reflective oddities and delights. Mirrors that make you short, tall, skinny, fat, mirrors that rotate, dead ends, and so on. As unawakened patrons enter through the Hall of Reflection, something feels off about the mirrors, but most typically dismiss it as part of the attraction. By night, Xanadu's Mirror Palace becomes the funhouse of the damned. Werewolves who look into the mirrors see in their reflection themselves in a frenzy. Vampires see themselves in the clutches of the beast, or even as whites. Some mirrors even serve as viewpoints into alternate realities, especially as night falls. In fact, the later it gets, the darker and more personal the reflections get. Repressed memories, secret shames, dark desires, dead friends, lost loves, old enemies all appear the deeper one goes into the mirror palace as the images beckon the viewer even deeper. Some beckon the viewer to actually enter a mirror and pocket realm that seems idyllic, but the longer a person spends in one of these mirror realms, the worse it becomes and the harder it is for the visitor to escape. Some mirror realms have spiral staircases that lead seemingly endlessly downwards. The walls of the staircase are inscribed with hieroglyphics, which an Egyptologist might recognize as symbols taken from the Book of the Dead. The further down one goes, the deeper their sense of fear becomes. At the bottom of the stairs are the snake gafflings, minor spirits, but still dangerous. Beyond the Hall of the Reflection is the Mirror Maze. By day, the maze is stupefying and challenging, but a few who enter the maze at night have never been seen again. The key to escaping is moving towards the center of the maze, an open room filled with yet more mirrors, However, these are embellished with interlocking onyx snakes. The largest of these mirrors is a pathway straight into the realm of Apophis, where it will peel away its victim's soul like the layers of an onion before finally consuming it. Only those with a powerful will can escape this lightless realm. Usually, once Apophis is fed on a victim, it spits their bodies back into the circus, stripped of intellect, will, and soul. The second largest mirror, is a prison realm for the vampire Mordblend of the Tremere, formerly ruler of the two worlds before his usurpation by Calibris. He is kept pinned by stakes, begging for release from captivity and torment. Those who try to enter his mirror prison, either to rescue him or to steal his potent blood, as he is an elder of the fifth generation, will find their own blood being stolen thanks to Mordblend's reflexive use of Theft of Vitae, a choice piece of bait left for vampires by Apophis. What's more, when someone enters Mordlin's prison, the entrance closes behind them, so they have little time to either save or slay the vampire. Those trapped with Mordlin inevitably become his next meal. Aside from the Mirror Palace is the Merry-Go-Round, a carousel of mythical beasts such as dragons, griffins, unicorns, and sphinxes, painted with masterful detail. There are 20 in all, each accompanied by an infernal spirit, which can animate the carousel beast at the command of the Infernal Trinity and defend the Midnight Circus for a single hour. But for visitors who find the Mirror Hall too old-fashioned or the carousel too slow-moving and lacking in electronics, there is Arcadia, a wood-walled arcade filled with an odd mishmash of games from the 1940s all the way up to the 1990s. Pinball machines, fortune tellers, tests of strength, shooters, fighting games, and even VR helmets. Most of these games are safe to play and cheap, though it does leave people with a sense of lost time. A few games, especially those made by TELUS Entertainment, contain vain spirits. Some of the better known offerings include Kill Wolf, where the player takes the role of Old One-Eye, leader of the Action Bill Commandos, bravely trying to deliver medical supplies to an Indian village when the commandos are attacked by werewolves. The most popular fighting game is Urban Warrior, featuring fan favorites like Morgoth, Dolores Rosa, Pancho Villa, 
T. Rhino and Tojo Tanaka. If a visitor spends enough time in Arcadia, they gain two snares. Those with a preference for the Telus games risk being possessed by Banes, eventually becoming an arcade walker. Then there is the Queen's Own Theater and Puppet Show. At the entrance of the circus's Renaissance Fair is a wooden stage designed to look like a checkerboard with a backdrop of the London skyline in the 15th century. The stage is shared by the Queen's Own Theater, the Puppet Show, Clown Jugglers, Vesuvius the Fire Eater, Ringwain the Minstrel, and Orenda the Storyteller. The clown actors and dancers perform the best of Shakespeare twice a day, speeding through scenes from Julius Caesar, Romeo and Juliet, The Taming of the Shrew, Much Ado About Nothing, Richard III, and Henry V. The puppet show is run by two of Bishop's clowns for the entertainment of children. Most of their performances, however, have some darker themes for those who care to look closely enough. When the end strikes them, Anastasio and Astarte clear the stage for a game of human chess, enlisting performers and sometimes audience members to serve as the pieces. This may be one of the most benign amusements of the Midnight Circus, and visitors who are quote-unquote captured during the game are released at the end without incident. The Renaissance Fair is a brightly colored spectacle during the day, with costumes, food, music, and other festivities. Ringwain, Calypso, and Mr. Quigley are the most prominent members during the day, but the fair packs up each evening, with the changelings disappearing into the dreaming. Occasionally, curious changelings may follow them secretly. Other supernaturals, particularly those with low banality, may be invited to join the Renaissance Fair's nightly frolics. The Renaissance Fair, in the fairy court at night, is a fairy glade built around a green bale fire. The rulers of the Freehold are the Summer King and the Autumn Queen, Astarte, who graciously welcome visitors. The fairy food enchants all who eat it for the evening, or longer if Astarte wishes. But despite the pleasant appearances, the Freehold is unseelie to the core. Mortals who are enchanted are ravaged for glamour. Changelings who spend too long in the Freehold will find their unseelie natures taking over, as they partake of more and more of the rebels. Additionally, the powers of prodigals function unusually, or in some cases, not at all. Scattered throughout the Midnight Circus are a variety of concession stands, offering food and souvenirs for purchase, or to win in games of chance. Most of the food and prizes are normal, however a select few contain banes, or have snares and barbs attached to them. Most of the Midnight Circus's pizzas come from Giuseppe's Pizza Stand, though it is more sinister than it seems. Anyone with the power of spirit detection who focuses on the pizza oven may notice the infernal sigil glowing in the back. In addition to making tasty slices, the oven processes souls stolen through snares and barbs, and it isn't the only one. Destroying the oven releases all of the soul stuff stolen that day. Most of the other devices aren't as easy to notice, however, as Giuseppe's pizza oven. Bacchus's tent, on the other hand, is the largest dining area in the circus, marked by a sign indicating the god of the vine. All in all, it is a humble, if large, area. Picnic tables, folding chairs, a bar, and an outdoor kitchen. The food is the usual picnic offerings that can either be grilled or baked. The manager is Maria de la Montana, a Colombian woman who can keep even the freaks in line and make sure that Blotto's stool at the bar stays free for him. A special offering is Anastasio's old-time lunar beer. It is a dark beer and filled with banes. A single bottle imposes three snares. The tent is open to visitors during the day, but at night it belongs exclusively to the carnies and clowns. It is usually during these nighttime wind-downs that the clowns get a little wound up. Fights have been known to break out between Bishop and Coba's clowns. The assorted interpersonal dramas of the circus play out here. Friendships, enmities, romances, conspiracies, etc. Bacchus' tent is one of the few places that the human carnival workers can truly feel safe, if only for a while, commiserating over cheap food and cheap beer, and occasionally good liquor. The top shelf only comes out if Anastasio or Astarte decide to grace the tent with their presences. On Friday nights, Bacchus' tent holds a theme night for a local charity, as it's good for publicity and draws more people to the circus. But now that snack time is out of the way, let's continue with the tour. The Museum of Oddities is between Coba's tent and Arcadia, and is a wood and metal maze with a single entrance and exit, 
lorded over by the eccentric Dr. Owl, who appears to be some sort of mad scientist. His museum is cluttered but orderly, filled with photographs of oddities and signs explaining these human aberrations. But the photos are just the appetizer. The exhibit area is where the feast is held. Dr. Owl in his exhibit, the lion-faced Leon Tilden, leads small groups through the museum, patiently but enthusiastically explaining the facts and statistics associated with the appearance of human mutations, birth defects, and other unusual occurrences in nature. Dr. Owl's studies seem fixed in a certain point in time, however. Anyone who pays attention to his overwhelming volumes of books may notice that he does not have anything relating to biology or zoology published after the 1940s. Dr. Ryle's current oddities includes Alexander the Horned Man. Alexander is a satyr, born in Greece and raised by the circus, his only form being his fairy mean. While in a cheerful mood, he plays the pipes of Pan, which can influence the emotions of his audience, though they must be enchanted first. Repeated performances and influencing can lead to listeners becoming his slaves. Another is Clymene, the fish lady who was caught off the Azores by a pair of Portuguese fishermen. She was a chimera who accidentally entered the material world. Slowly she became entirely physical thanks to the circus and Dr. Owl's banality. Clymene has a sharp sense of humor, and she can make men easily fall in love with her, which leads them to delusions of rescuing her, which Dr. Owl must deal with. However, despite fleeing the circus once, Clymene actually enjoys Dr. Owl's company, and the two often discuss philosophy and poetry. She's also friends with Alexander. Seraphim, like Clymene, is a creature of spirit, the child of two chimerlings, caught in the near umbra and changed by the circus. Her name is due to her appearance, a woman with blue and red feathered wings, dark hair and eyes that seem to have fire behind them. Seraphim is one of the few oddities not caged as she is capable of flight. She is shy but plays the lute when Dr. Owl asks. She is also in love with Alexander but wouldn't think of fleeing unless the horned man came with her. Hathor the Sphinx was added to the circus during a visit in Egypt, however few in the circus, even Dr. Owl, know anything about her origins. She has the body of a lioness and the head of a human. Most of the time she is silent, pacing her cage or sleeping. However, when Dr. Owl leaves, she will answer a single question put to her by any person, and only one question. Alexander and Clymene have conversed with her, but Hathor now ignores them. Dr. Owl believes that Hathor is a simple beast who can occasionally mimic human speech, but she can look into the future, and what she sees there she keeps mostly to herself. Olga the Harpy was found by the Black Sea. She lives in a giant bird cage with the body of a bird and the head of a woman. She stares intensely at anyone who passes her cage. Dr. Owl believes she is the product of Soviet nuclear testing in Kazakhstan. The truth is she is an ancient creature awakened to serve the Baba Yaga during its brief reign of terror in Russia. Olga's wings, however, are torn and she can no longer fly. However, her claws are still sharp and can rend even Garu flesh. Mehin the python is a massive gray and yellow serpent 18 feet from nose to tail. It is kept from other circus people, but Mehin likely killed and ate the museum's centaur boy. Not even Dr. Owl knows how it happened, since he has taken extra care to ensure that Mehin does not escape. At night, the other oddities can hear Mahin chanting in strange languages, Egyptian and Aramaic. The serpent lacks any human intelligence, but it is a vessel for Apophis, verbalizing its master's infernal wisdom. Mahin can even hypnotize his victims, and his poisonous bite can paralyze prey, making them easier to crush and eat. While Dr. Isle's oddities are kept in a small modicum of confined comfort, the freaks housed in Freak City a press board labyrinth and theater are treated more like livestock, but the nature of the performance depends on the time of day and the location. The King of the Freaks, a famori called Cone of Flesh, only appears in more progressive towns, but even the mundane freaks are disturbing to all but the hardiest or most depraved mortals, which is why the attraction is discouraged for the faint of heart and children, except that children tend to disappear within Freak City never to be seen again. Cone of Flesh sits at the center of the Freak City maze, a massive slug reclining on garish cushions, attended by a scantily clad harem of monsters. Cone of Flesh is a psychotic cannibal with a taste for Fomori flesh, but he is not the most dangerous thing about Freak City. 
The power of the worm is great here, and visitors who enter the living area gain one snare for every minute they spend there. Every barb they gain from Freak City manifests as a deformity in their flesh. At five barbs, in addition to losing their will to the circus, transforms them into a freak, and they take their place with the rest of their kind. If a person leaves before gaining five barbs, the physical deformities fade with time. Moving along quickly from matters of the flesh to matters of the spirit, three magicians occupy a tent in a lightly traveled corner of the circus, though never at the same time. In fact, each of the three occupants of the mystic's tent act as though the other two do not exist at all. Awakened mages notice that the tent gives off energies of prime, spirit, and time spheres. Garu smell wild energy emanating from the place. The first of the magicians is Kuanin, a Chinese medium. While she is in the tent, it is brightly colored, covered in banners, kites, and symbols of good fortune. Wraiths find the tent to be a safe harbor from the tempest and Apophis while she is there. Her style of magic is fortune-telling through Chinese and Tibetan methods. As a medium, she can also contact and negotiate with the dead. She is aware of what the Midnight Circus is, but regards it and its history as trivialities in the scale of the cosmos. When Kuanin's time in the Mystic's Tent is done, the restless dead also lose their sanctuary. The second magician is Sergei Gumilov. During his time, the tent appears Middle Eastern. Persian music flows out of the tent and captures the attention of passers-by. He will hypnotize willing parties and even remove barbs if asked. Gumilov will gladly explain that some of his act is real magic, other parts sleights of hand. He knows the path of Kara, however he has taken a vow to not actively harm the circus. The third magician is Herr Fiddler. During his residency, the tent is black with red trim and smells faintly of sulfur. Thankfully, he is only there for an hour each day. His magic involves science, though he is not particularly interested in entertaining anyone, whether they are paying customers or not. There are two circus attractions that are only ever seen at night. The first is Semiramis's loft, which is the circus brothel. The loft admits only invited patrons, attracting some from a nearby tent which features exotic dancing, 18 and over of course. Admissions to the loft are limited in each town, issued on distinct engraved cards of black and ivory, created by the loft's proprietor, Mr. Smiley, who vaguely resembles Pee Wee Herman. After some relaxation and refreshment, visitors are given a key with a room number on it. Each room is a horizon realm where the visitor's deepest and darkest fantasies await, to be satisfied by one of the hetere, an old Greek word for prostitutes. The hetere will indulge in every whim a visitor desires, so long as it does not result in harm to the hetere. If they attempt so, they will be dispatched to a violent realm until they fully exert themselves. The cost of these carnal delights is four snares per visit. Those who become shackled to the circus via the loft often become hetere themselves, or are transformed into oddities bound for Freak City. The other nocturnal circus attraction is Fortuna's Wheel. This gambling den is the personal domain of the Midnight Circus's ringmaster, Anastadio Salvatorio, or as he's better known, Devin Cavendish. It is festooned with garish flashing lights that read out, Beat the House at Fortuna's Wheel, along with oversized playing cards. The inside is quite luxurious in a contrast to the rest of the circus. I guess if you're going to lose your soul, you might as well lose it in style. Standing out from the decor are the wax Native American chiefs and a statue covered in eyes. The games are blackjack, roulette, and slots. Cavendish makes the rounds and works the tables, coin changer on his belt and shaking hands with everyone who enters. Cavendish is also working the players, using entropy to determine the outcome of each turn of the wheel in the cards. He is well practiced in stringing his prey along with a string of winds, only to tear it away from them with a combination of fast dealing, fast talking, and fast magic, encouraging them to continue, even as the losses start piling up. By the end of the night, many players have lost their shirts and some are all but ruined. Then Cavendish, ever sympathetic, offers to return three-fifths of their money because they are clearly honest, good people, and gamblers should stick together. So he offers them a contract that reads, I, blank space, 
Hereby let it be known that I lost my soul gambling at Anastadio's old-time lunar carnival in Midnight Circus. I hereby forfeit all rights, entitlements, and obligations of said immortal soul to Devin Cavendish, proprietor. Signed, on behalf of the board of directors, Devin Cavendish. The kicker is the drawing of the cartoon. The kicker is the drawing of a cartoon devil at the bottom, offering a contract to a despondent businessman. Most people take it as a joke, laugh, sign it, and even take it with them as a souvenir. However, the more perceptive will realize that Cavendish is not joking. He is taking your soul and feeding it to Apophis and the Defiler Worm, one piece at a time, after taking his cut out, of course. Once Cavendish has collected one or more souls, he closes up for the night. Some gamblers later realize instinctively that they have willingly bartered away their own souls as their sleep is plagued by nightmares. Cavendish uses his cut of souls to purchase pieces of his own back from the board of directors, as he calls them. Before the midnight circus moves on from a town, Fortuna's wheel is filled with gamblers desperate to get their souls back at the tables. The smarter ones realize that gambling is what got them into their predicament and try to bargain with Cavendish directly. Some even offer up others, friends, family, and loved ones, just to make the nightmares come to an end. So those were the pitfalls and traps that masquerade as amusement and fun in the Midnight Circus. But who are the players in this Circus of the Damned and the Damnable? In the Midnight Circus, nothing is as it seems on the surface. Those who appear humble can be powerful, and those who appear mighty can be weak. The seemingly harmless can be the most terrible monsters, and the most monstrous in form can be the most humane in spirit. Authority in the Midnight Circus is largely dependent on the patronage of the stakeholders, rather than personal power, though the two are often closely connected. And standing at the apex, or possibly the nadir, are the Infernal Trinity. To that end, we begin with the Ringmaster, Devin Cavendish. In the 15th century, Devin Cavendish was born in Italy as Anastasio Salvatorio, the bastard son of a priest who was raised by the priest's brother, an artisan. While still a boy, Anastasio discovered the flowering rod of St. Joseph in a ruined Florentine church. Word of the boy's prayers and revelations reached the celestial chorus, who determined that he was pre-awakened and approached Anastasio's uncle with an offer to foster and educate him in Rome. Anastasio proved prodigious in his studies and voracious for knowledge. His tutors believed that he had the potential to become primus of the tradition. It was his curiosity that caused his downfall. After his awakening and induction into the Celestial Chorus, Anastasio trapped and destroyed two Nefandi, transporting texts to a hidden redoubt in the Pyrenees. But rather than destroy these profane tomes, Anastasio concealed them for himself. It was his study of the Libre de Mare, penned by Carouche the Doomed, that started him on his path to damnation. It was believed that Carouche had fallen to Takshaka of the Kashik Brotherhood in 1343. However, there was a code in the Libre de Mari indicating that the Persian Nefandis had concealed himself in the Caucasian mountains, which Anastasio found and used to track down Karush, not to slay the Nefandis, but to become his apprentice. Karush was impressed by Anastasio and gave him the name Yagild and taught him the careful art of infernal soul transaction. When Karush released Anastasio from his tutelage, he remarked joyfully to his other disciples that he had just unleashed the dervish of hell on the world. Anastasio joined the circus in India, or Asia Minor, apprenticing himself to then carnival master Mauritius. However, Mauritius was a mere hedge wizard, not an awakened mage like Anastasio, so the apprenticeship was brief. The Nefandis then offered Mauritius a bargain. Give up the title of carnival master, and Mauritius could keep his life. But when he refused, Mauritius was hunted and torn apart by his own dogs. Anastasio quickly allied himself with Astarte and placated Theodoric with his usefulness to the administration of the circus. When Theodoric was usurped and slain by Mordland of Clan Tremere, Anastasio and Astarte quickly acted to remove and replace him with the Toreador Calibris. As matters presently stand, Anastasio, or as he's known in modern nights as Devin Cavendish, is one of the most powerful members of the Infernal Trinity, owing to his careful balancing, calculations, skimming, and bargaining with the stockholders, as he refers to the worm in Apophis. 
His own soul is a horror, a piecemeal quilt of his own soul fragments which he has bargained for and reclaimed for infernal power, or parts taken from other souls. Cavendish's true ambition is to recreate the Midnight Circus in his own image, reclaim the entirety of his soul from the worm and Apophis, and elevate himself to a dark incarna, a malefic god with the carnival as his temple and feeding ground. If Cavendish is stopped, either by his partners in the Infernal Trinity or outside interference, he plans to take his skim-souled prophets, abandon the Midnight Circus, and establish a new carnival elsewhere. The second side of the Infernal Trinity is Astarte, the Autumn Queen, she who rides upon the back of the Apophis Serpent. She is the oldest, if not one of the mightiest, of the Midnight Circus's Infernal Trinity. She is also one of the few she who remained on Earth during the Interregnum, and has been with the Midnight Circus since the 8th century AD, when the carnival was beset by knights of the Holy Roman Emperor Charlemagne. Astarte led the carnival to safety from the Emperor's paladins through a secret fairy trod. Since then, her role has been to navigate the circus through the realms, material and spiritual, all the while being seduced by the power of Apophis. Curiously, Astarte cannot lead the carnival to Arcadia, which she longs for and dreams of. She believes that Apophis is the harbinger of the long winter, that once the world is symbolically and physically destroyed, the door to Arcadia will open once more during the world's rebirth, a belief that Apophis is made certain to remind her of. She is not, however, sadistic in her treatment of others, but she sincerely believes that any means is acceptable to return to the paradise of Arcadia, including the deaths of others. And the third side of the Infernal Trinity is Calibris. Calibris, who was once assigned a Prince Villon of Paris and favored in the salons and soirees of the vampire elite of France. However, like many overindulged children, Calibris became cruel and decadent. What he wanted he took, regardless of considerations of humanity or politics. Finally, Calibris became such an embarrassment and inconvenience to his sire, Villon threatened to call the blood hunt against his wayward child if he did not leave France forever. Calibris wandered to the east and took up with a band of Ravnos brigands in the Carpathians, eventually rising to lead them and mastered the discipline of chymistry while in their company. His encounter with the Midnight Circus in the 17th century was very convenient, if not serendipitous. At the time, Devin Cavendish and Astarte were combating the Tremere sorcerer Mordblin for control of the Midnight Circus. Cavendish made the offer to Calibris, a place in the Infernal Trinity, in exchange for his assistance against Mordblind. Together, the current Infernal Trinity trapped Mordblind in a pocket realm of Apophis within the Hall of Mirrors, where the Tremere starves and screams to this very day. In the intervening centuries, Calibris wove his illusions throughout the Midnight Circus to make it reflect his taste as an illusionist, magician, and predator. They also keep his daytime lair concealed from all in the circus. He is the only member of the Infernal Trinity who neither possesses infernal investments nor has struck any bargains with the infernal powers, and Calibris to his thinking does not need them. He has already styled himself in the fashion of a Mephistophelian predator, a dark, mysterious lord of the night who seduces his victims to their own doom and pays for their trust in agonizing death. Yet, it is his lack of demonic patronage that has made him a target for the nearly forgotten former mistress of the carnival, Kara. The goddess fans the guttering embers of Calibris' humanity, filling him with thoughts of compassion, introspection, and worst of all, guilt. Calibris has done his best to keep these lapses hidden from the other members of the Infernal Trinity. However, Kara has been working at Calibris' conscience for over 50 years, and regards him as a potential vessel for her return to power over the Midnight Circus. Beneath the Infernal Trinity are the Second Circle, those who are particularly high in the service of the Circus's stakeholders, or who serve one of the Infernal Trinity closely, such as Baroque, a vampire of the Semedi bloodline. In life, Baroque, or Shi Su, was a villain of particularly notorious repute throughout his native Tibet. In his 60 years of life, he was a thief, torturer, bandit, rapist, murderer, and necromancer. He ruled an entire province by terror, killing and robbing all who ventured too close to his mountain fortress. But Shisu's infamy had won him an admirer, Morlock, a vampire of the Semedi bloodline, 
and former member of the Black Hand, who offered to give the aged tyrant an eternity to study death. Shisu accepted and became the vampire's child and apprentice, and once his sire Morlock had no more to teach, Shisu trapped him and flayed him until he was nothing but bones. However, Shisu's sire failed to mention that he was a renegade of the true Black Hand, and his sire's death just so happened to coincide with an attack on their lair by the Hand. Shisu barely managed to escape the Black Hand, though they pursued him. When Shisu stumbled across the Midnight Circus, he did not hesitate to pledge the remnants of his tattered soul to the Worm of Corruption in exchange for safety. Shisu is now known as Baroque, and masquerades as a tall Jamaican voodoo fortune teller, thanks in no small part to the Glamour Veil. Baroque aspires to take Calibris' place among the Infernal Trinity, but even if he managed to best Calibris, his elevation may throw the balance into turmoil as he regards Astarte as an enemy, due to his servitude to the Defiler Worm. By contrast, the Barabbi Mage known as the Bishop is a devout follower of Apophis. The Bishop was a contemporary of Devin Cavendish in the Celestial Chorus, but where Cavendish abandoned the tradition for greater power, the bishop abandoned the chorus over his belief in monarchism. So deep ran the bishop's Gnosticism that he became a worshipper of entropy, which in turn led him into the willing service of Apophis. He joined the Midnight Circus shortly after Cavendish, but has not grown in demonic patronage at quite the same speed. The bishop believes that the world must be cleansed of impurity, and that the masses will only accept the truth of the physical world's evil through comedy. The bishop's clowning and the circus itself is a brightly colored mask that hides the truth of existence, and that Apophis is not a demon, but an angel tasked by God to cleanse the cosmos of evil. In this case, all things material. The bishop makes for an oddly comedic figure in an oversized cassock, makeup split between a smiling orange and red side and a frowning blue and purple side. Standing in between these two servants of evil is Charles Edward Flint, or Mr. Flint. Flint was born in Vancouver, Canada. He experienced the first change as a Corax or were-raven, and joined his uncle as a member of the Hermetic Society of Swift Light, a Corax courier service to put it simply. While the Corax investigated the Midnight Circus, Flint's uncle was killed by an arrow shot by Morel de Aquesto, the Midnight Circus's horseman of pestilence. While the other Corax fled, Flint tried to revive his uncle. He soon fell under the sway of Devin Cavendish and by extension the Midnight Circus itself, becoming Cavendish's spymaster, right-hand man, and the circus's chief accountant. Flint is probably the only person in the Midnight Circus Devin Cavendish trusts, though Cavendish has never bothered to tell Flint who really killed his uncle. But even if Flint did know, he would simply find a way to kill Morel without endangering his position in the circus. The workers call the tall, gaunt Corax Ebenezer Flint for his miserly attitude, though never within earshot. Below these powers of the second circle are the third circle, members of the Midnight Circus who, through force or avarice, have gained some measure of personal power of their own, and even have followers. For example, the entirety of Astarte's court are members of the third circle by association with her. This includes the Summer King, a she who returned to Earth from Arcadia during the resurgence in 1969 with no memories. Astarte quickly captured him and converted him to her cause, shaping him into the Carnival Summer King, a beautiful, charming, and arrogant puppet who diverts attention away from the true ruler of the court. Yet the other changelings in Astarte's court obey the Summer King. Though he rules by Astarte's leave, he is formidable in his own right. The Summer King regards the court, the carnival, and the world itself as existing solely for his pleasure. To that end, he is a secret practitioner of Morpheus Sabinus, the changeling act of dream rape, forbidden to all seely changelings and to most unseely as well. Another member of Astarte's court is Ringwain the Bard. Ringwain was born to a minor distaff branch of House Fiona and honed his arts with any master who would take him on. During the Sundering, he was with a company of Ishu studying storytelling and heard rumors of Astarte's court. Though no longer the Autumn Queen's favorite, Ringwain is still a friend to Astarte, though he has his doubts about the rightness of her cause in returning to Arcadia, especially in the aftermath of the resurgence. His preferred instruments are the harp and the flute, which he uses to hold the banality of the world away from the Queen's court. He also questions visitors, 
and especially changelings about the outside world and current events. He generously pays for such information with song and story, some of which were thought to be lost forever to changelings. Another member of Astarte's court is Calypso, an Ishu dancer and singer from the Caribbean who enthralls visitors, and especially children with tales of faraway places. She can be found wandering throughout the circus, though she is often at the Summer King's elbow, whispering in his ear and encouraging him towards more cruel amusements. Despite her friendly seeming, she is unseely to the core, and dreams of supplanting Astarte in the Infernal Trinity. To that end, she will aid those who wish to harm or humiliate the Autumn Queen, so long as it cannot be traced back to her. Finally, there is Mr. Quigley, the court jester, with a sense of humor so wicked that it veers into torture, which is entirely the point. He is small, even by bogging standards, a prankster, acrobat, and dancer. He picks volunteers out of his audience from time to time to join in his act, often reducing them to tears as he rips apart their egos, humiliates them, exposes their secret shames, all while tormenting them physically with pies to the face and kicks to the behind, and other gesturely abuses. Mr. Quigley's merriment has so ruined some volunteers that they took their own lives soon after. Changing tempo from the fantastical to the irrational, there is Dr. Owl, head of the Museum of Oddities. Dr. Owl was born in Frankfurt, Germany in 1850 as Gerlach Augustus Yule. To his father's disappointment, he abandoned the study of the law in favor of the natural sciences and philosophy at the universities of Frankfurt and Vienna, respectively. His brilliance brought him to the attention of Dr. Christian Sohn, a member of the Electrodyne Engineers Convention of the Order of Reason. Yule and his mentor relocated to Paris, where Yule found a teaching post. On a whim, some of his associates took him to a nearby circus in the country. When the group stumbled upon the exhibit of oddities, its manager claimed that the occupants were Greek gods. Yule, incensed, proceeded to debunk, I mean, critique the attraction's claims with technocratic facts and logic, ending with the thorough scolding of the manager for clouding the minds of simple country folk with superstitious nonsense. But rather than throw him out, the ringmaster, Devin Cavendish, offered him a position of running the Museum of Oddities. To the surprise of his friends, Yule accepted, along with changing his far too German name to the more theatrical Dr. Owl. Dr. Owl is a contradictory man, a worshipper of science who is also a powerful mage. He believes he runs the Midnight Circus, even though the true power is with the Infernal Trinity, and Devin Cavendish is quick to name Dr. Owl as the man in charge if anyone comes to investigate. Even Dr. Owl's oddities, Stripped of much of their power by the doctor's own banality, feed the strength of the worm and Apophis by their very presence in the circus. Dr. Owl possesses one of the greatest collections of cryptozoology in the world, which to his rational mind are merely Darwinian accidents, which only survive at his sufferings. The collection itself is guarded, both from outside interference and from escape, by a creature called Husk, an amalgam of flesh, clay, and wax, mobilized by matter-sphere procedures. As far as the doctor is concerned, he is still a member of the technocratic union, despite the electrodyne engineer's abandonment of the union in favor of the traditions as the sons of ether. It is unlikely that he would care about such a triviality, even if he were made aware of it. Dr. Ryle's assistant in the running of the Museum of Oddities is Leon Carpenter. Carpenter was raised by his aunt and uncle following his parents' separation, due in no small part to the birth defect that gave him his leonine appearance. After a childhood of cruelty, he joined a series of traveling sideshows before joining the Midnight Circus. He ingratiated himself to Dr. Owl, eventually becoming the mad scientist's assistant. Where the doctor is indifferent and embittered towards his collection, Leon is kind and caring. However, he is also loyal to both Dr. Owl and the circus, which have given him a place in the world. But because this is the Midnight Circus, we must quickly depart from kindness and return to cruelty. And there are few in the circus quite as cruel as Cone of Flesh. Many who see Cone of Flesh for the first time mistake it for a giant pile of rancid mayonnaise. In the 1920s, one of the seventh generation's projects involved the gestation of Fomori via the Formorak pits. However, one of the medical cast noticed that the Fomori were not emerging from the pits as scheduled. The technician did not return from this investigation. Half of the armed recovery team sent to locate the technician died under the weight of the fleshy blob that had killed and eaten most of the newborn Fomori. 
When the rest of the team subdued Cone of Flesh, the medical cast realized that it was self-aware. However, its appetite for Fomori was costly and Cone of Flesh was slated for destruction. Yet it managed to escape. It was then captured by the Midnight Circus and placed in Dr. Isle's Museum of Oddities before being moved to Freak City. Cone of Flesh took over the Freak Show and turned it into its own little kingdom, which is rather impressive for a nine-foot-tall conical slug wearing makeup in a tiara. Cone of Flesh prefers the taste of Fomori to humans and will turn humans into Fomori with Procreate, then reshape them with Maliate into more appetizing forms. But where Cone of Flesh merely looks funny, or horrific depending on who you ask, Koba the Clown, chief of the Progressive Clown Show, thinks he is funny, and that all should appreciate his form of humor. In his past life, Koba the Clown was Yerdegif Sasha, a Russian destined for the seminary before he abandoned religious orthodoxy in favor of a life of petty theft in theater. Sasha fell in with Tosia Karolek, a comedic actor trained in Germany, and purveyor of underground progressive humor. The Karolek troupe joined the circus of Kirill Nikolai, a wealthy but indifferent patron. When the politics of Russia entered upheaval, Karolek seized the circus in the name of the performers. When Karolek died of heart failure, Yeregev Sasha stepped in to succeed him under the stage name Koba. But another member of the circus, a magician named Pyotr, was infested with a mind feeder bane. While the circus was traveling on the Kyrgyz steppes, a silent strider Garu attacked and killed Pyotr. The mind feeder Bane, now wounded and without a host, found Koba and tried to possess him. What emerged was more symbiosis than possession, as Koba was too strong willed to be taken over completely. For his part, Koba is unaware of the infestation and simply believes he is able to bend others to his will through sheer force of personality. Koba is now wholly a creature of the worm. He found the Midnight Circus to be the perfect stage for his brand of progressive humor. At least it will be, once Bishop and Blotto are out of the way. Putting aside humor for hellish joy is the specter haunting the Ferris wheel, Zimbra, or as he was known in life, Godfrey Towns. Towns was the executioner for London in his day. In fact, he so enjoyed his work that he would, without authorization, execute certain criminals ahead of schedule. For a few months, nothing came from this except satisfaction of Towns' bloodlust. But one of the men Towns executed early had been pardoned, or would have been had Towns not taken his head too soon. Towns soon paid for his abuse of justice with his life, ironically, under the very acts that he was so fond of. When he emerged in the Shadowlands, he was taken in by the Artificers Guild, but quickly fell under the domination of his shadow. His work took on menacing appearances, and his mask grew more frightening as he sought out souls for the forges. When the guild discovered his atrocities, Towns managed to escape justice by plunging himself into a harrowing. What emerged was the specter, Zimbra. Zimbra still has access to the Shadowlands and the Skinlands thanks to one lone fetter, the block he used to kill his victims, now on display in the Tower of London Museum. Zimbra stumbled across the Midnight Circus, destroyed its previous spectral guardian of the Ferris Wheel, and made it his own lair. Now he uses the place as a hunting ground to draw wraiths into the Maw of Oblivion, and if he can torture them into insanity on the way down, well, that's just an added treat. But if Zimbra and the Ferris Wheel are a promise of doom for wraiths, then the Mystic Tent, at least for a time, is a sanctuary especially when the mystic Kuan Yin is in residence. Kuan Yin was born in China near Jian, learned healing from her mother and grandmother. She traveled to Tibet with her husband to learn mediumship. She sensed the restless dead gathering around the Midnight Circus and joined it to aid the living and the dead in escaping from its clutches, for a fair price, of course. For her, the circus is a crucible to test her discipline and sharpen her practice of healing and necromancy, though for benevolent purposes. The second mystic, Sergei Gumilov, is a collector of esoteric traditions from Persia, Tibet, and Ethiopia, which he has synthesized into a practice he calls Triadosophy, which is in truth Hegelian dialectic blended with Eastern mysticism. In joining the Midnight Circus as a fortune teller, he has managed to stave off the infernal and corrupting energies of the circus by tempering his master over the primal forces of the universe. He is also one of the few members of the circus who knows the path of Kara, 
and can point seekers in her direction. However, he has also taken a vow not to physically harm the Midnight Circus. The third mystic, Herr Fiddler, is an Etherite Barabbi and an enemy of the Etherite pulp hero Doc Aeon, at least he was during World War II. Their conflict ended when Fiddler fell into a volcano in Scandinavia. The SS Colonel only saved himself through the use of a vulgar correspondence magic, though the lava and paradox scarred him permanently, which is mostly covered by his beard. In his wounded state, he wandered into the Midnight Circus and opted to stay there. Fiddler, however, is still an ardent believer in Aryan supremacy, a position which Devin Cavendish has instructed to keep to himself, if only for the sake of business. Fiddler is a mage of middling power who performs divination on the basis of his client's ethnicities. He also offers to teach attractive women dual tantric exercises he learned from the Atlantean masters in the Hollow Earth. Beneath all of these are the members of the fourth circle of the circus. They are the rank and file circus performers, concession workers, and roustabouts. They have little power, but there are more of them than in any other circle. One of the newer members of the fourth circle and the circus in general is Aubrey Duterte, the son of a French diplomat and his Indian wife. As such, Aubrey grew up in New Delhi and Paris and honed his skills as a gymnast with dreams of entering the Olympics. However, these dreams were scuttled by the first change. His cousin Dorita inducted him into the ways of the Bagheera. He continued on with his parents to his father's posting in Ottawa, Canada and attended the University of Montreal. He also practiced gymnastics at the university where he met Guy and Jean Rasson, along with Colette Blanche. The Rassons and Blanche joined the Midnight Circus at Trois Rivières. When Aubrey mentioned it to Jarita, Jarita was shocked. The Bagheera had been investigating the Midnight Circus for years, but couldn't get close to it. Aubrey quickly volunteered to infiltrate the circus for the tribe and to protect his friends. Aubrey left university and tracked the circus to New York and was signed on as an acrobat at his friend's recommendation. Since then, Aubrey has learned much that disturbed him about the circus, especially the deaths of the prior acrobats. He learned even more from the circus sharpshooter, Bell Star, with whom he plans to escape and report back to his tribe, though he can't seem to work his way to doing so. The other half of the plotting escapers is Bell Star, or Myra Bell Shirley, as she was born in 1848 in Carthage, Missouri. The rare breed of female gunslinger and outlaw, she rode as a partisan for the Confederacy and later with various outlaw gangs. In 1889, she was gunned down. Then Windwalker of Clan Gangrel appeared to save her through the embrace. Belle Star, as she called herself, tried to atone for her years as a bandit by using her gun to protect the innocent. The circus used this desire for redemption to recruit her into its fold, sending a child actor to ply her with a sob story of someone in need of rescue from the circus itself. For 60 years, she has worked for the Midnight Circus and tried to escape multiple times, but the circus has its barbs in her, and she finds her way back as distance drains her willpower. She now understands that the only way she will be free of the Midnight Circus is to destroy it completely. But where Bell Star wants to leave, Lee Carmody can't think of anywhere in the world he would rather be. Carmody is the scion of a wealthy Nebraska family who cultivated his unearned cynicism through a series of private schools in Yale, made more pronounced by his interest in the unnatural. The cult of ecstasy seemed like the first place he truly belonged in life. However, he came to the realization that external stimuli was just another dead end. His poetry collection, Jamshid's Dream, won him renown with the beatniks and hippies of his era, but no satisfaction. His dissatisfaction morphed into bitterness and contempt for the world. When a fellow ecstatic asked him to investigate the Midnight Circus, he found a new place to hang his hat and feed his disgust with the human race. He is the attendant for the Tunnel of Love, which he uses as a way to force entrants to confront their own meaninglessness. The only thing he feels sympathy for are animals. He has a dream of constructing a disease to wipe out the human race and leave only animals behind, 12 monkeys style. So far, he hasn't achieved the desired result, but still he tries. And on the subject of animals, we may as well discuss the circus's trick riders, the De Aquesto family, or, as they are otherwise known, the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. The De Aquesto family began as Florentine mercenaries who secretly served the worm. 
Their prestige in combat brought them into the service of the Sardinian royal family as animal trainers. In 1854, Galtero de Aquesto founded the Circo Royal to display his family's horsemanship across Europe. It was following one such performance that Galtero met Anastasio Salvatorio, or Devin Cavendish, and the two realized that they served a patron in common. The Circo Royal merged with the Midnight Circus. The most skilled riders of the De Aquesto family are known as the Four Horsemen, who also serve as messengers and hunters for the circus. The current lineup includes Messora De Aquesto, the Horseman of Death, and the only woman in the current incarnation, Bellicus De Aquesto, the Horseman of War, who fancies himself a knight and seducer, Filippo De Aquesto, the Horseman of Famine, an intellectual and elitist who has a, let's say, suspiciously close relationship with his sister Messora, and Morel De Aquesto, the Horseman of Pestilence, who overcame his club foot to join the Horseman and wants his family to be a larger act in the circus. The De Aquesto's horses are Fomori, hand-picked by Lord Steel, one of the Malesian in Karna. The steeds can see in the dark and run for two hours at top speed without rest. But where the horsemen are fearsome because of their battle prowess and their riding, the Heteri are fearsome because they lure their victims to their own doom. The Heteri are courtesans who lure new converts to the circus through sexual attraction. As a group, the Heteri are the most cohesive force in the circus, and while few of them hold much power as individuals, as a group they wield considerable influence through seduction and skillful manipulation. In deference to the carnival's shareholders, the Heteri are classified as either incubi or succubi. Eolantha is one such succubi formerly an unseely knight of House Gathic before her expulsion, as the House claims neither seely nor unseely loyalties. She chose to join the Shadow Court as a mercenary and hunt down the remaining she on Earth at their behest. One of her hunts during the Interregnum brought her to Astarte, who drew the knight into the circus and then enslaved her to it. The Autumn Queen transformed the knight into something opposite of what she had been, a bringer of peace, joy, and love. Though she is brainwashed, it is possible for her to return to her former state, in which case, she would be very, very angry at what was done to her. A fellow succubi is Rati, who was born to the Brahmin caste and lacked for nothing, at least until the Midnight Circus came to Bombay. The circus captivated her, and in particular, a tall, dark magician who became her lover, and then her sire. Calibre still trusts Rati, and she trusts him, but their relationship is cool to one of allies and occasional companions. Roddy seeks to protect Calibris from those who would do him harm, especially Baroque. She regards her role as a succubus of the Heteri as a holy calling, a blending of the physical and the spiritual, Shakti and Shiva, life and death. The newest Heteri, Alexander, an incubus, was once a proud warrior of the Silver Fangs of Russia. However, most of his fame was due to him advertising his accomplishments. Things changed when the little grandmother, the Baba Yaga, awakened and drew the shadow curtain across Russia. When faced with an overwhelming force of beasts in the Hag's army, Alexander broke, turned tail, and fled into the Umbra, where the Midnight Circus was traveling. Baba Yaga ensured that none could leave Russia, but the circus was beyond even her considerable power. Alexander passed out when confronted by the tale of Banes following the circus. When he awoke, he was surrounded by the incubi and succubi of the Heteri. He feels slightly guilty about leaving his pack behind, but he put his own skin first. What Alexander doesn't know is that a Bane has been placed inside him, one that will drive him to suicidal valor if the circus needs to awaken it. But if sex sells, then deformity is not too far behind it which is the philosophy of Freak City, and its collection of midgets, pinheads, geeks, freaks, and fomori, most of whom live in the press board maze. One of the foremost is Mr. Bile, a geek, or, as he was born, Freak Foot number 149J, who was birthed in a Pentex facility in the early 1990s, but he was a failed product thanks to his small legs, ape arms, and second head. The only thing that saved him from being ground down into Formarak was the timely intervention of a pack of Garu who raided the plant that had created him. Number 149J escaped in the chaos with others, but to the freak feet, he was just, well, too much of a freak. 
The Midnight Circus saved him from loneliness and probably destruction, and gave him the name Mr. Bile. His two heads get along quite well, the smaller of which is named Little Ralph. Depending on the audience, he wears a green plaid suit jacket, or, in more progressive areas, a leather body harness and mask. His favorite trick is to stuff rubber hoses down all four of his nostrils, followed by a processed mixture of food and beer. He then vomits it up to the horror or delight of the audience. You get what you pay for at the Freak Show, and Mr. Bile makes sure you get it. A recent addition to the carnival is Mulella, the Mule Girl. Mulella has accepted her physical appearance, at least she says so. Her face does not exactly look like a mule's, except that it's hairless and white. But she is starved for attention, and this makes her a target for those who would abuse her. She also shares some of her impressions of the circus with those who treat her kindly. However, the longer she spends at the Midnight Circus, the more erratic and prone to violence she becomes against those she thinks are making fun of her. Another freak, Burlap Boy. Violence is literally his stock and trade. He is a Bane born from the Atrocity Realm who materialized as a scarecrow-like creature, and dances in midair, contorts and sings. While dematerialized, he whispers in the ears of patrons, suggesting all sorts of unspeakable crimes. But when he's hunting prey, his weapon of choice is a sickle, which he uses to slit his victim's throats. Even if an enemy managed to dispel or defeat him, Burlap Boy will eventually return to the circus. Compared to the cruel and murderous Burlap Boy is Hermaphrodite, the bearded lady. Hermaphrodite was born to an aristocratic German family and shuffled from one orphanage to another due to her hirsutism. It was only by sheer luck that she was not slaughtered in an extermination camp. She was later picked up by the Midnight Circus on the whim of Devin Cavendish because, to his reasoning, every circus needs a bearded lady. When shorn of hair, Hermaphrodite is reasonably attractive but somewhat slow. During the freak show, she is carried around on an ostrich and then used as a subject of one of Dr. Owl's lectures on human oddities. Her only friend in the circus is Mr. Bile. She will help those who are kind to her, though she will not do anything to risk Mr. Bile or provoke Dr. Rao. Lastly in the freak show are the Enforcers, the Barlows. The Barlows are a family of midgets who serve as Cone of Flesh's secret police. They are ruthless in the extreme and many underestimate them because of their stature. Canny and well organized, they are an effective team, even against supernatural creatures. All of them carry silver daggers and guns with silver bullets. Furthermore, they possess Bane fetishes that allow them to disguise themselves as children. Moving swiftly and thankfully away from Freak City, there is Orenda Foamsinger, a storyteller of the Midnight Circus. Orenda grew up on a reservation in Ontario and was sent to the Wendigo tribe when she showed signs of being a Garu. After completing her rite of passage, Orenda went on a quest to find the remnants of the Croatan. She journeyed to New Mexico to speak to Old Red Eagle who had witnessed their final sacrifice. She then found the Midnight Circus and began to investigate it, but was intercepted by Cavendish and Astarte, who hypnotized her into believing that she was in fact the last of the Croatan, and that she had been left to guard the last Croatan cairn, but was driven off by the Geta Fenris, and then saved by the circus. Cavendish and Astarte use Orenda to shield them from attacks by the Garu, and made certain that she remains untainted by either the Worm or Apophis. In her hypnotized state, she believes that the circus has the means of resurrecting the Croatan. In the meantime, she serves as storyteller of her people in the circus, and as a buffer to any Garu who come nosing around. Then there are the Scribunda sisters, Aurora, Meridia, and Fata. The three sisters are fortune tellers for the circus and are seldom seen together. Aurora, the youngest and most beautiful, runs the booth during the day, and specializes in tarot and palm readings. Meridia is an older, handsome woman who calls out to potential customers in the crowd during the afternoons and evenings, while Fata is an old, white-haired Romany woman who waits in the booth at night. Her powers take the longest to manifest, but hold the deepest insights. The Sisters' Tent is a sanctuary for those on the path of Kara, or in need of healing. Their tarot deck depicts various members of the circus. The Bishop is the Fool. Calibris is the magician, Astarte the high priestess, and Cavendish the emperor. 
The tower card is the big top tent struck by lightning, and the world is Kara, triumphant over a destroyed circus. They can also remove a limited number of barbs from the afflicted. Mixed in among the remainder of the fourth circle are the carnival hands, such as clowns and dancers who also work as vendors and ride operators. Day-to-day -day operations are run by Mike Ellis, who is the ride overseer, and Maria de la Montana, who oversees the vendors, both of whom are subordinate to Mr. Flint. These carnival hands and workers seem worn down and dispirited, enduring the midnight circus's toll. Some harbor hidden suspicions about the circus's true nature, but rarely voice them. Some even have almost figured it out. One such ride operator once hinted at it, but was swiftly replaced from his job. But there is a circle below the fourth. There is the fifth circle, the lowliest of the circus, the outcast. Those even the freaks of Freak City look down upon. One such is Koba's pet bear, or as he was previously known, Dmitry Babinov. One of the Gural, or werebears, Born in Siberia, Dmitri learned to mimic humans by observing them from a distance. He then took the name Dmitri Babinov for his human form, but preferred to live as a bear. Koba captured him using his mind feeder powers and brought him to the Midnight Circus, transforming him into a loyal enforcer and circus act. Dmitri despises his captors in his dreams, but he can still be saved with a substantial effort. If he is awakened, he can be a potent ally against the circus, but recovery from its effects would take years. Years that those seeking to either undermine or destroy the circus may not have. But if Babinov has had a rough couple of years, then the unfortunate Nosferatu known as Tub of Flesh has had a rough couple of centuries. In the 1600s in a Norwegian fishing village, Hans, a curious young boy, often broke his parents' rules. One night, lost in a misty fjord, he sought shelter in a cave, and unknowingly entered the lair of a mad Nosferatu. He emerged the next night as one of the sewer rats, a Nosferatu, roaming and feeding on animals and avoiding people, until he had the singular misfortune of being discovered by the Zemitsi, Sasha Vikos. Vikos, on a whim, experimented on the boy vampire and transformed him into effectively a liquefied vampire, a roiling mask of flesh, teeth, and various other limbs and extremities. Hans became a grotesque figure and wandered in this unfortunate state for years. Later, he was captured by the circus and set as a watchdog. Hated by the other freaks due to their hierarchy, he is a pariah, but he is also protected by fear and the decree of the Infernal Trinity. Despite his status as Cone of Flesh's pet, Tub of Flesh will not attack a child, and has even gone out of its way to protect other children from the circus, though they are terrified if they see what he truly is. Another member of the circus who is an object of terror, though for a very different reason, is Tamika Tanaka of Clan Malkavian, also known as the Night Mine, or the Hell Sister. Tanaka was born in Kyoto and raised in the countryside by her grandparents while her father worked in the United States. She and her brother then followed their father to San Francisco, much to her sorrow, as she enjoyed the simple country life. Soon after reaching San Francisco, she was embraced by Albrecht Osberg, a Malkavian and actor. In her newly broken mind, she narrated the embrace as an ancestor spirit, offering her a role in a nocturnal drama. Afterwards, she met Angelo, a Toreador mime with the Midnight Circus. She fell in love and followed him back to his domain. The two vampires managed to simultaneously entertain visitors and terrify the carnies. But Angelo would meet his end at the claws of a Garu, breaking Tanaka's last tenuous link to reality. To her maddened eye, the world is a intricate no-play through which she glides in silence. She does not harm members of the circus, though all except Baroque and Lee Carmody avoid her, she has not spoken a word in the sixty years since Angelo's final death. In silence, she hunts her prey in the towns that the circus visits. But soon, her play will enter its third act, when she confronts the White Lady and the Dark Man for killing Angelo. Until then, she must play her part flawlessly.
Another outcast who is less an object of terror and more of scorn and pity is Tattoo Tim, who runs a parlor out of a battered trailer outside of the front of the circus. Tim is a tall man with goatee and glasses, and usually wears a sleeveless t-shirt, exhibiting his arms which are decorated in tattoos of the Midnight Circus with a moon logo and a mermaid. He lives in the trailer where he also gives out Bane-infected tattoos to the unsuspecting public. He is a nervous chain smoker and a heavy drinker, preferring cheap whiskey, which he doesn't bother to clean up the empties from the floor of his working space or living space. Before he came to the circus, Tim was a struggling art student making caricatures at a theme park when one day he just snapped. Working in the sweltering July heat, he pushed a popular costumed actor, Poacher Possum, into a water ride where the costumed actor proceeded to drown. He joined the Midnight Circus soon after. Working closely with Bane materials has warped Tim into a mumbling, drunken wreck. When drunk, he likes to slam dance against walls while mouthing old Sex Pistols lyrics. While Tim might be a bumbling wreck, the animal trainer, Bill Bullock, is at the end of his rope. He is an overweight alcoholic, and after a recent salary dispute with Mr. Flint, one of the lions mysteriously attacked him. Bill hides the scars with his shirt. His own brutality towards the animals, and especially the black spiral dancers that are trapped in hispo form, have earned him their undying hatred. There have been several occasions when he's been so drunk that either Aubrey Duterte or Devin Cavendish have had to step in and perform his show on his behalf. His days are numbered, even if he doesn't know it, and the circus is actively searching for a new trainer. It is only a matter of time before an unfortunate accident with the wolves takes place, and his job becomes available to some unlucky sucker. And that was an overview of the Midnight Circus. That was a lot of material, and I kind of blitzed through it, even though this ran for an hour and a half and some change. But it seemed appropriate for Halloween. A circus ruled by demonic entities, soul-taking mages, demented clowns, deformed freaks, murderous midgets, several portals straight to hell, and, of course, bad fairies. The Midnight Circus was one of White Wolf's latter-day cracks at doing a crossover-friendly adventure after the thrills and spills of the Chaos Factor book. In fact, the Midnight Circus is framed in such a way that one exclusive group of supernaturals, such as a coterie of vampires, a pack of Garu, a cabal of mages, etc., probably couldn't tackle it without bringing in some outside help from another type of supernatural, due to the multiple layers of powers at work in the Midnight Circus. But anyway, that's all I have on this one. Eat some candy, watch a couple of scary movies, put on a cheap costume, whatever it is you do tonight. Just have a fun Halloween. Until next time.